we'll, we'll just keep uh, get started. So first of all, thank everybody for uh, for, for attending this webinar, uh, a webinar on Africa's recovery, crisis crisis management, and uh, and, and COVID. Um, we've got our guests on today, Andrew Robinson from from Tibet, as well as PMI's uh, Steve Townsend. Um, just a few housekeeping points. Uh, first is that uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so, you know, you know, firstly, take note of that. If there, if there are any issues, if you do have any issues, with it, then kindly let, let us know by a uh, direct message. And, uh, and then the, the second point is what well, related to the recording. We'll send that to you after that. Uh, third point, please do keep your microphones on, on, on mute. Uh, the system is set up so that you're automatically on mute. But uh, in some instances, for some reason, we do get microphones un unmuted uh, coming coming on. So the the format of today's session is um, we're going to kick off with an int introduction by Stephen Townsend and uh, and myself. We're talking about PMI and then also about uh, adaptive programming. And then um, Andrew Robinson is going to cover the the bulk of the uh, the crisis management management aspect of, the, of this talk. So I think uh, without further ado, further ado well, we can we can kick off. And you know, whilst we're speaking, please do feel free to uh, put any questions that you might have, put them in, in, in the chat. And what we'll do is just during the course of, of this of this presentation, we will be reading the chat. Uh, my colleague Joanna is on, online. She um, will be collecting the questions, and um, at the end of the session, we will um, read out all the all the questions that we're able to. Uh, to, to read out within the time that we have. So everyone, thank you once again for, for joining and um, yeah, let's, uh, let's kick off. Thank you very much. So next slide, please, Stephen. So just a little bit about uh, PMI, just two minutes. Um, PMI is a project management institute. Uh, it's the world's, world's leading association for, for, for project management. Uh, essentially the way I describe it is that if you're you know, if you're if you're an accountant, for example, you wanna you wanna go and do the uh, an ACA or ACCA or or, or CMA to uh, you know to prove your credential, you know, prove your your qualification. It's exactly the same with uh, with PMI and our credentials as well. Um, so PMI, the credentials that we 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 essentially uh, uh, own or even uh, so like certify are you know the PMP. Most of you have heard of that. But that's the project management profession, uh, professional. And then several others ranging ranging from CAPM, uh, which is a, you know uh, the level before that, and then also looking at certifications such as uh, Discipline and Agile, which which looks at uh, at uh, Agile methodologies. Obviously, in today's world, we're we're looking at a, a many of the time we're looking at hybrid models where it's you know it's not only your tra traditional um, serial project management, and in some instances, it's it's not necessarily your hyper Agile. A lot of times it's a, it's a combination of both. So we uh, certify professionals um, who um, who work across the spectrum of those types of, of project management execution. As an organization, we're, we're, we're spread globally. Um, the, the numbers there speak for themselves. We're so like a global organization with chapters across uh, uh, across uh, many continents. Next slide, please, Stephen. In terms of Africa, um, the way we're, we're, we're set up uh, globally actually is that you know we have so like the, the PMI Global, which is headquartered in in, in, in Philadelphia in the U.S., uh, but then across across many countries and cities we have uh, the chapters, and the chap chapters are uh, it, independent uh, groups of, of of project managers who um, who work in the project management uh, profession and who. Uh, assist and help their local communities to uh, essentially execute better because that's what project management uh, is, is, is all about better execution. So this map, you can see that we're, we're spread across uh, spread pretty well across Africa with uh, Nigeria and South Africa being our largest our largest markets. There are a few countries coming on, on, on board at the moment. Those are uh, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Namibia, Rwanda and, uh, and Zambia. Uh, and then to top it all off, in addition to the, the certifications that that we have, but we actually have um, training providers who are able to uh, help those who want to get certified, or help organizations who want to uh, establish some kind of training system in, in, internally. 
Uh, so these these uh, these organizations are what we call the registered education providers. Uh, they're, they're, they're they're organizations that have, have been verified by by PMI and work in partnership to ensure that uh, the training occurs at a particular standard, a particular high standard, um, so that individuals and, and organizations are able to certify against the the, uh, the project management standards. So that's just a high level overview of um, uh, of, of PMI's Africa business. Uh, and if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, again, very very high level in terms of what we do. I mentioned that we you know we are the so like we offer the global standard in in, in project management. Um, and essentially, there are three buckets uh, to look at in terms of how we do that. You know, first of all, is at the actual standards themselves, which are uh, created in house and and with uh, a couple of uh, um, standards bodies. For example, the the ISO, um, and uh, included in in that uh, bucket are also uh, our our thought thought learning initiatives and offerings, as well as um, some of our um, uh, individual uh, learning assistance. So, so, for example, snippets where you can listen to project management on the go, Navigator, and and project map uh, and projectified podcasts. So, it ranges the, the standard side on the on the left of your screen. That ranges, as I mentioned, from your uh, uh, standards and ISO uh, so, um, uh, standards, so to speak, to individuals listening to podcasts. In the middle, those are the certi uh, certifications we're talking about. I'm not going to go into, into detail on that right now, um, but if you're if you're interested to find out more, do do get in, in touch. Uh, I mentioned, for example, the PMP and Discipline Agile and, and Brightline, which looks at how do you how do you uh, as a as a as a leader, uh, how do you uh, translate your uh, your strategy into better execution and organizational uh, excellence. And then on the right. Um, We've got a network of uh, uh, professionals and trainers. We have a massive, the, the world's largest community, community of, of project managers. Um, so obviously that there's a lot of learning going on. There's a lot of uh, community development going on um, there as well. I'm not going to go into much detail. I, so that's a um, very high level introduction of, uh, of PMI. Please do, do feel free to, to, to reach out. Um, as I said, my name is George Asamani. Part of my role is to work with organizations who want to improve their, their project management execution, They'll basically improve their execution as a whole. And one way to do that uh, effectively is through, through project management. So, so, um, so please do, do get in touch. Um, thanks for your time. I'm now gonna hand over to uh, Stephen. He'll introduce himself and then continue with the, with the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, George, and thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Um, the focus of today is to talk about how uh, project program and portfolio management can help organizations respond in particular situations. And today's theme, given that uh, we still have a global crisis dealing with the COVID-19 virus, we felt that this would be a good opportunity to share some insights into how uh, different ways in which you might think about uh, responding to crisis or disaster situations. So as George mentioned, my name is Steve Townsend. I'm a uh, PMI employee. I've been with PMI for 20 years, and my role in the organization uh, has been to uh, work on special projects and programs, including uh, a lot of effort around uh, thought leadership uh, and research. So my role in today's presentation is to share with you some insights from our research and from work that uh, project management practitioners like yourselves have done related to um, how to respond effectively uh, when disasters occur. But the meat of our presentation is going to be someone who brings extensive experience in actually running these initiatives on the ground from healthcare situations to natural disasters. So I think you're really uh, going to get a lot of uh, excellent information uh, from Andrew Robinson, who's our core presenter today. So to set the stage for uh, Andrew's presentation, I wanna start with uh, disaster and crisis management uh, is really a situation that requires adaptive project management at its best. And as I was looking at some of the research related to um, 
how, what are common themes in how project management adapts to uh, disaster or crisis situations? These seven themes uh, surfaced over and over again. The first is that when you're dealing with a crisis uh, or a disaster situation, people are at their most vulnerable. They're upset, they're frantic. Uh, oftentimes they may be uh, injured or displaced. Uh, and they don't know what to do in that particular situation. And so the response really has to be people centered. And that means that you have to adapt to the situation with the people on the ground that you're working with. So when you're working with your team, you can be very professional and very focused and very task oriented. But when you're dealing with someone who's going through an emotional crisis, you need to adapt in that situation to help that person uh, be able to focus so that they can put themselves in a safe situation uh, where they can get other types of support that they may need. So part of adapting is understanding that uh, you need to adapt your behaviors and your mindset to make sure that when you need to focus on your tasks, you have that focus, but when you need to be out in the field working with people who are actually experiencing the crisis, that focus needs to shift. The second, and um, Andrew is really gonna talk to this in more detail. When you are uh, working a, a disaster or a crisis, you are often part of a network of respondents to that particular situation. And one of the core challenges uh, that we've seen in certain crises is when that network is not effectively linked with clear goals and where everyone understands what everyone else is doing, that can often be a recipe for disaster. So one organization may think that they're helping, but they're actually creating situations that others have to deal with. So think about how to, uh, link into the activities that are going on in a way that is aligned with the goals and objectives of the main orchestrator of the response effort and be sensitive to the fact that you may be trying to do things that actually interfere with those overarching goals and objectives. So align yourself uh, as best you can uh, in a supportive role as opposed to uh, trying to uh, jump in and lead. Structures for response have to be very flexible and adaptive uh, because, again, the situation on the ground is changing. Roles and responsibilities need to be clear. So there needs to be a chain of command. And again, that networked effort where everybody understands what everyone else is doing in the process ensures that everybody is working towards the same goal, even though they have unique activities that they're trying to drive forward. It's very important and very crucial to have real-time information and measures. And the active feedback loops links in here as well. So in some disasters, organizations have realized that there may be people on the ground, uh, for example, uh, store owners or gas stations uh, or police or other authorities that have information about what's going on in their particular sector of the uh, community. And so they can be a uh, information conduit to give you live information about what's going on in their area. And at the same time, because they often are places where uh, people who are impacted by the crisis or the disaster gather, they can also distribute information to people who are affected by the crisis. So again, if you, if you have that networked uh, concept in your mind, Look at how you can leverage uh, community-based structures that exist to help you collect information and to help you respond. And again, your responses have to continually adapt because the situation on the ground is always changing. Now, how does this relate specifically to project management? Well, as we know, one of the potential risks with any project is that the team is not clear on what the goal is. So you have people working uh, towards different ends, thinking that they are working towards the real objective. So again, it's very key to have one team and one goal 
with everybody understanding what their role and responsibility is in this environment. Uh, Andrew is really going to talk about the second concept, and that is the connected response network where you have a hub. So there is a leadership structure that will be put in place, usually uh, by a governmental authority, uh, and there will be partnerships to help the government entity coordinate its response. So you want to be connected to the right area so that again, you are helping to enable the response as opposed to doing things that might be counter to or might actually uh, interfere with the response. As you're learning and what's going on in the field, you're going to be adaptive, adapting very quickly. So unlike a traditional project where you're planning from start to finish, in a disaster situation, you're doing micro planning. You're planning for the situation as it evolves in real time. And you're using your learning, you're using those feedback loops and the information that you're getting from the field to get an understanding of is your response being effective. So again, you're learning how many people do we need to deliver food or supplies to, or how many people do we need to uh, treat? How many people are queuing up for vaccines? All of that information is going to help you understand the extent to which your response is actually meeting the needs of the community, and you're gonna use that information to adapt. You are going to have failures in a disaster or crisis situation. It's just going to happen. And you can't spend your time worrying about whose fault it was or why did it happen. Uh, it's key that you put the fact that it happened on a parking lot so that it doesn't get lost because it's an indication that there's an opportunity for improvement, but you wanna focus on making sure that you continue to respond to the situation. So there will be failures, the focus is how do we recover the situation and then how do we learn and improve uh, once the uh, disaster or the crisis situation is over. There has to be continuous risk monitoring and response. And in disaster and crisis situations, it can be very difficult because again, you're going into this where people are vulnerable, they're at risk, uh, and there are challenges associated with uh, trying to service them. But at the same time, there may be broader risks that you need to think about. So for example, in a healthcare crisis, if someone has potentially been exposed to COVID-19, to Ebola or whatever, you don't want to bring them into a situation where they can potentially expose other people. So if you don't have the infrastructure in place to help them get the right type of service while also maintaining isolation so that there's not a broadened exposure base, uh, then you may be again, exacerbating the risk. So you need to think about and evaluate risk continuously throughout this process. There will never be a point where you have all the information that you need. The key is to, again, leverage the network, collect as much information as you can, and use that information to make the best decisions that you can in real time. Because again, the situation is going to be constantly changing and unfolding. And then lastly, active stakeholder engagement to get that holistic view, to understand the threats and the opportunities that you face, to keep your team safe and secure as while they're trying to respond to people who need their support and assistance is also important. So it is really uh, from a project management perspective an adaptive systems focus that is going to help you and your teams successfully respond in a crisis or disaster situation. And as I mentioned, you all are in for a incredible presentation from someone who has extensive experience in dealing with real life situations from natural disasters to uh, healthcare crises as well. So I am now going to turn it over to Andrew Robinson, uh, who's going to introduce himself and actually deliver uh, the core of our presentation. Andrew, on behalf of PMI, I wanna thank you for joining us today and I turn it over to you to continue. Thank you, George and Joanna for inviting me to speak to 
Africa uh, today. I'm very passionate about utilizing PMO in times of crisis, and hopefully today I'll enhance some understanding. Uh, I'm going to present about 45 minutes worth of material here, so that'll take us just past the hour, but we will leave some time for Q&A and discussion. I think that can be some of the most uh, productive part of the dialogue. Uh, next slide, please, and let's go ahead and get started here. So uh, the, the role of the uh, PMO in terms of crisis management is one that sort of makes obvious sense, I would say. I mean, you would not build a bridge or a pl airplane or et cetera without a PMO and pro project management constructs. And, and you shouldn't do the same with crisis management. The PMO can serve as an agile organizing construct. And I've had that, I've, we've, I've tried that, it's worked, and I've done it multiple times. And so now we'll talk about some of the places uh, where I've picked up some crisis and disaster management experience. I uh, was at Kennedy Space Center uh, soon after the Challenger shuttle disaster and actually took a, a lead role with adjusting the launch complex scheduler uh, with using technology such as fiber optics. It's been eight years there at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, later, I was uh, brought down to Baton Rouge in, in Louisiana to help out with Hurricane Katrina. Uh, it's our na the nation's largest disaster uh, at that point in time, and I was named executive director of the program management office there with Katrina. I, t I played a, uh, a role with uh, Hurricane Sandy. We had a housing program that, which was stuck on the rocks. It was in trouble, and I, uh, I uh, uh, performed a, what I would call a, a quick turnaround on, on that project. Um, and then with Ebola, uh, I got a call from the Army. They asked me to raise some volunteers to go into theater, uh, Sierra Leone and uh, Liberia in, in particular. And um, we worked with the Army Force Provider providing logistics uh, for the workforce there that was doing the containment and tracing with Ebola in theater. At the same time, for Health and Human Services uh, in the Office of Assistant Secretary of Planning Readiness, uh, we developed over a nine month period of time the Tracy system. And you might have heard of that if you're in the pandemic uh, epidemiology world. Uh, Tracy is, is the Technical Research and Assistance Center. Uh, for information exchange that we use here in the U.S. and, and listservs are used uh, in a broader sense. I've also been involved with Hurricanes Irma and Maria in the Virgin Islands, worked on a large billion dollar program called STEP and helped uh, uh, bring that one to a successful closure using some of the very same techniques I'll talk about today and then worked in setting up their PMO for the Office of Disaster Recovery there on island. Just a few months ago, I was working with COVID-19. I wrote the strategic plan for Wood O'Brien's a crisis management company, and uh, worked with hospitals, um, local governments, universities, et cetera, in their response to COVID-19. Uh, so from that base of experience, I'll now talk about some of the things I've learned, some of the tools, methodologies, and then we'll discuss that further. Next slide, if you will. So, I would uh, um, like to sort of go ahead. There we go. I, I would like to sort of um, talk about the the purpose of the presentation, and really, what I'm hoping to do is build a connection for you between whatever the issue or problem or disaster or crisis is, all the way through from the program um, uh, through the PMO to manage it successfully with. Uh, uh, with metrics. And if I could build that link with, linkage with you, I, I think we'll be in, you'll be in great shape for um, handling the next uh, crisis that you might encounter. COVID-19 is, is a very interesting crisis. Um, four weeks ago, when uh, Steve and I started to talk, um, the U.S. was looking like we were coming out of phase one. Things, things looked bright. In Africa, didn't seem to have much of a COVID-19 problem. Things were being well managed. Well, this quote comes to mind. Often when you think you're at the end of something, you're at the beginning of something else. Certainly that applies to the 
U.S. currently. We don't really know where we are at, at the end of phase one or, or, or something uh, broader or, long, or longer and broader phase one. We don't really know. Uh, say that a PMO in managing a problem like this could play a very pivotal role. It's a steering wheel for an organization to drive a program where agility is required. And of all the disasters and crises that I've been witness to, uh, this one certainly seems to uh, uh, to require agility. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And now we'll talk about um, some of the some of the implementation and uh, um, ins and outs of how you make this all come together for your disaster or crisis. Next slide, please. So um, I, I'm going to talk about a few topics. I want to describe to you what it's like uh, working in a crisis and make sure you sort of build an understanding of that. I think it can help you personally when you get involved with, with uh, something like this. Uh, some of the challenges that you will face. Hopefully you can pick up some lessons that I've learned over the years. And then I want to talk about a PMO architecture, something that uh, you might have as a stalking horse for when you create a PMO uh, in such a setting. I'm going to heavily emphasize uh, data and decision support. You really need to make uh, data uh, your friend <laughs> in managing a program, uh, especially in such an agile manner. And I'm going to talk about how to do that. And then we'll finish up with some discussion around critical success. Um, and then on to Q&A. Next slide, please. So uh, what is it like? Um, understand, and I, I would say try to build your understanding, first of all, from the citizens and the patients. They have had turned upside down. Um, their lives might, in fact, be at risk and oftentimes are. Their businesses, their jobs are sometimes no longer there. In this case, the economy could be shut down. They don't know how they're going to pay their bills. They don't know how they're going to pay their housing mortgage. Their frustration will run high. They're emotionally frail in many cases. Can't tell you how many citizens and people in the disaster and crisis um, management environment, uh, you know, have had conversations while they were crying, um, you know, and understand that this is tough. It's, it's very tough for the people to get affected. Um, and they pass that on to the politicians, obviously. And so it's a highly charged political environment. Um, and uh, th they will oftentimes play the blame game. And the elections will amplify uh, if there's upcoming elections in your country and there's a disaster or crisis, that will be a weapon for the opposition uh, and they will use it every time and it becomes very highly uh, charged political environment. Is a significant media coverage second after a war, I would say comes disasters and crisis as a news story lead. Uh, the media will be all over these and will in some cases fan the flame and in some cases can be the source of misinformation. We'll talk about stakeholders and managing stakeholders in a little bit. But you will receive significant media coverage. So uh, I, I, hope, I don't want to scare anybody, but if, uh, if, if you haven't been in this uh, type of environment, it is a tough situation, but you can get through it. And, and, and I'm, I'm hopefully going to help you with that. I, I think the most important thing is that you maintain a servant-minded attitude. Think about the citizens. Think about what you're there to do. You, if, you, if you wear your ego around, if you have a chip on the shoulder, if you take things personal, you won't last long, I guarantee you. But if you think about yourself, you're sort of like a, a you know, a doctor or a missionary or somebody like that, you're there to help. You, if you develop this servant-minded attitude, and and yes, you will get yelled at, but if you're calm and you just think problem solve, problem solve, problem solve. Don't get emotional. Try to calm things down. 
bring logic and, and, and a rational approach and problem solve. And if you do that over and over again, the people around you and the environment will eventually calm down and you'll get to where you're actually um, programmatically executing and when you get to, you want to be in an environment where the program is executing and you're addressing the outcome that you're there to serve. Next slide, please. Uh, the challenges. You're going to start without the end in mind. People don't have for program design. They're not going to uh, wait six months like they might for, if you're building that bridge or that airplane they might wait for six months to make sure you do a really good job on that uh, with crisis disaster management they want you on the ground now all the requirements fully defined and so you take an agile approach you must take an agile approach uh, PMI in, in the uh, days past used to call this iterative elaboration you begin without the end in mind. But in a way, crisis and disaster management makes a lot of sense. So you must start organizing. You must, must start communicating. You get going. And that's how you learn. And that's important to start the learning process so you can figure out what your programmatic outcome needs to be, what your processes and procedures need to be. So getting the outcomes is very important. And you want to understand what is the goal of the program and get your stakeholders to buy in and support that. Now, this is not, not to confuse, but to clarify. You want to get clarity on what your programmatic outcome is as soon as possible and get the stakeholders to support that. Next slide, please. I've, I mentioned the word stakeholders quite a bit. And I would tell you, that in my experience with disasters that I've been involved with, no stakeholder owns the entire issue or is in control. Now, sometimes they tell you they are. Um, they're elected officials, uh, are elected by the people, but they have to have an understanding of the broader stakeholder environment as well. Um, I've had a few people tell me they are in control. I just need to report them, make them happy until they weren't. It is a multi-stakeholder environment uh, that we're working in. Let, let's, let's go around the world, as it were, here and talk about that just a little bit. So from a health perspective, you've got, you've got the international health scene, you've got the country level, you've got the local. You, as an example, internationally, you've got, you got World Health Organization, you've got Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Country, you have the ministers of health. Local, you have doctors and nurses. Multiple levels of stakeholders in the health environment, economy, banks, both international and local, uh, businesses, large and small. They don't all want the same thing at the same time. So there's multiple stakeholders in the economy. Media and social, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the media is definitely a stakeholder and uh, uh, social media now has become a big influencer and driver of information and misinformation. And so that needs to be paid attention to. Politic, that's rather evident, but uh, there's multiple levels of politic, right? There's, there's uh, country level, local level. Environment and climate, there's advocacy groups that are outspoken now. Education, uh, universities, schools, et cetera. Uh, uh, here in the US, Johns Hopkins has got built a Bully pulpit for themselves on COVID-19. They have quite a bit of expertise in this area. Uh, Nonprofits, um, they have, depending on the country, they can have a voice in these types of situations, obviously crisis management. So I want you to think broadly about stakeholders. They will have a voice. They can be ally or enemy. Um, in a way, sort of you decide. Um, but in many cases, they also have some answers for you as well. You'll come across some difficult problems occasionally, and you'll need a resource. They could be the solution. So don't think about this being a contentious environment. Coordinate it. Communicate with it. 
Get them to be on your team. Make them a part of the program. You might say this is, could be an entire job itself. Keep that thought. I want you to keep that thought because we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a PMO in the COVID crisis. It's based on a recent COVID experience. Uh, a, a client called us and said that they had lost containment, um, which is a real problem with COVID. This is, I mentioned Ebola early with Ebola. It's obvious when the patient was sick and had Ebola, it was, it was self-evident. And you knew to keep them away from the body fluids Containment was easier in a way. With COVID, it's aerosol spread uh, through the air and can be done spread from asymptomatic people. Don't even know they're sick. Very difficult once you lose containment with COVID to ever get it back, especially without a robust tracing program. So we got a call and they realized that they had lost containment and we stepped up to begin to help them. This is this is a rudimentary uh, version of what we did. Uh, we immediately identified a senior medical officer, an epidemiologist with uh, uh, a good bit of expertise in viral disease. He had a public health background in policy and communications. We then supported him with public health um, um, expertise and officers. Now understand that a epidemiologist and a public health person are different. A epidemiologist has the medical and scientific knowledge of how that disease interacts uh, with the body um, and how it's spread, et cetera. Public health people are, think of that expertise in society-wide, um, environmentally-wide. Uh, they know how to um, let me uh, sanitize and um, close down or open up um, um, in the infrastructure of an economy in a safe manner. I think it's probably the best way to put it. So um, bigger, broader level responsibility for the public health officers. We also supplanted this PMO with some uh, programmatic expertise with project analyst, and then we had some data and decision support as well. So what are the rules for PMO in the COVID crisis? Um, one is crisis response, obviously, but there's others. There's supply chain management uh, for food. Uh, sometimes you, when you shut down economies, uh, you have to feed the people. We certainly have here domestically. Uh, and then also it could be used for a distribution of PPE. It could be used for containment and tracing. Uh, I'm sure will be used for vaccination delivery. Speaking of stakeholders, the World Health Organization uh, Vaccine Alliance, um, Gavi also referred to, will be a stakeholder with vaccination. And, and, and if the PMO did nothing else but coordinate stakeholder communications and the work that they did, that would that would be a justification for the PMO in and of itself. But obviously there's a lot more work to be done out there. Um, but that's this is just sort of a example of what's what I've seen working uh, as it relates to COVID. Now if we will go to the next slide, I'll show you a set of these two concepts coming together the stakeholder concept and the PMO operational concept. So this is born out of some experience that I've had where we were managing a very large program and we were stakeholders kept popping up and yes, they were distracting uh, and they did have different programmatic goals and visions and outcomes for the program. And until we recognize that we got to manage at both levels well, it was very difficult to manage that program. So then we accepted that and said, you know what? We're gonna have some, some of the senior people focused on these stakeholders. And, and they have to be thinking about the management of the media, the political communications, the policy decisions, and focus on that. 
Then we have to have some other senior people focusing at the operational level, and they have to be focused on the execution and job done day by day and not being distracted. So the top level was, yes, to, to minimize at the operational level, but also coordinate all those resources. And clearly there's a lot of communication daily, multiple day between the two levels. Until you under a large, very difficult programs in this environment, recognize this construct and adopt it. Uh, I, I just really struggle, but if you can get this concept alone from this presentation and take this with you, you'll be you'll be miles down the road. Okay, next slide. Uh, this next slide is a is a um, sort of a reference slide or a bonus slide, if you will. It's actually from an actual PMO in one of the disasters I mentioned. And we would have anywhere between 250 and 650 FTEs working itself, depending on whether or not we need to scale up with some um, strategic projects. But it, but it, most times, at least 250 people. So it's a very large program. Now, the previous COVID ex, uh, example was like 9 to 15 FTEs. So, so PMOs for crisis can be at any size, any level. It could be two or three people. I'll just, I'll just get that out of the way and say it could be that small and still be effective depending on what the requirements of the program are. But this slide is, has almost everything in it. So if you, if you get down the road and you need to increase the scale of your PMO, you need to put one together, Hopefully this slide can help you out with a little bit of that. So the first one, just, just roughly, I'll go through this quickly, is for senior coordination, the policies and procedures, or for developing and maintaining those policies and procedures. Management, oftentimes large programs need other contractors and subcontractors to come aboard to help. So we had this for the acquiring and the coordinating of contractors. Uh, the fourth box is collaboration of communications. Let me say a word on, on that before I move on. Make sure you're communicating to your own workforce as well as you're communicating to anybody else. Don't think the workforce picks it up automatically. They, they will not. They're out there busy running hard at, at, at execution. And keep them in the loop as well. Oftentimes that's overlooked, but important to get done. Uh, five is the program control board. Now, I want, I want to be clear about how I say this. Change and, and managing it in an agile manner is required. Too much change unmanaged can kill a program, especially in this environment. This program control board was set up to manage change. I think that's an important concept to understand. Yes, you want to be able to change. You have to. You want to adopt an agile approach to managing the program, but it cannot be unfettered. It can't go wild. It can also crush a program, especially large programs, if the change is not controlled. Program Control Board also manage risk and other issues as well. And then we have a whole group of people working on decision support metrics. Um, obviously, program support such as QAQC and then special projects. Just a word about this. Uh, we, in this PMO in particular, uh, like to refer to ourselves as easy button as we walked around to the other operational departments. We said, if you need some help, if you get stuck on something, if you, you know, run into an insurmountable problem, call us. That's what the PMO is there to do. Think of us as the easy button. We'll come in and help you fix it. We'll put our best and brightest on it because we can't have those type prob problems and issues stop the progress of the program. It's important to get that concept out there. And we owned it and we did not delegate. We didn't, we didn't say, oh, yes, we understand what your problem is. We'll get so-and-so in to fix this in a week or two. We never did that. We said, okay, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're gonna help you fix this program right now. Okay. So the easy button, I think that's important in these large 
projects with crisis and disaster management to have something out there for people that are under a lot of pressure. They want to know that they can turn to somebody for their help. You want to be that person. Next slide, please. I'm going to take you through um, at a high level, sort of soup nuts, how you, how you bring uh, this all together. So uh, just just hang with me and we can go back and talk about this in the q and if you don't, uh, if you've got questions around it. So the first step is define the program goals and, uh, and get to the what. What is this program being funded to do? What do the stakeholders think the outcome should be? Drill down and get to the what and define it. Step two is then to bring further specificity to it and determine the where and the how many. Okay, I, I now know what I got to do. Where do I have to do this and how many people or how many uh, buildings, et cetera, do I have to repair in this area? That helps you understand and achieve scale. Those, this is where the math starts to come in. These are the numbers, okay? So this is a, an important piece of the understanding of what your task is gonna be. Step three, pretty simple, is by when. And this needs to be, uh, you can only come to this number, uh, the schedule, after you understand step one and step two. Uh, th I think that's self-evident, but it's understand that they sort of follow that order. Step four, you then start to put the program together. You're, you know, you, you've developed the charter. You might be able now to do some program design and develop policy and do some architecting, uh, maybe some systems design, put an organization chart together, staff it even. Uh, basically, uh, you're answering the question, what does it look like? What is this going to look like? You're starting to put together the structure of the program at this point. Then says, okay, I got people in place. They own this department. Let's have them own and develop their own process and procedures and make sure that they come up with two things, P measures and R, which is part of step six. P measures are process measures. R is result measures. An example of this, so let's say you're going to feed people in the rural setting and you defined, you know, how many meals a day uh, and where they are and how many people. Uh, now you need to say, okay, well, my supply chain, how, how much food do I need to buy? How many trucks do I need to have uh, to deliver? Uh, how many people, do, those are your process measures. And then your result measure will be, eh, I've got 100,000 meals delivered today, I did my job, the R measure results measures. Keep it simple as possible. Uh, two reasons. One, senior management, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being funny, but but do keep it simple, senior management, and keep it simple uh, for the people out in the field. Uh, they're actually executing it. But you definitely will want to have P and R measures. And tell you how many projects and programs I've stepped into and one of the first things I did was try to establish, okay, folks, do you, do you have this organized so that I can have PNR measures? A lot of cases, the answer is no. It says, okay, now I'll, go, I'll drop back to step four or five, something like that. Say, let's, let's go back and try to put this together correctly and come up with some PNR measures. Uh, I won't go forward in a, in a program or a project without it, quite frankly. And the reason is, the result here, ability to measure and manage. You want to have ability to measure and manage your program. And that's what the PNR measures do for you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a Python report. Think of the Python report. It's a, it's a methodology I've used and tool that I've used several times to turn around projects and programs, large ones and small ones. But, but you can use this in very large ones as well. And I have. And think of this as the pig passing through a python. So a python has swallowed a pig, and you want to be able to see that pig as it goes through the python and gets digested. And at the end of the day, the work is done. 
So keep that visual in mind, and I'll talk a little bit more and give you an example. Next slide, please. So um, this is a real world example. Um, an island is actually three islands had been devastated by two hurricanes in less than a month. All right, let's, let's, let's walk through this because I'm going to take it all the way from the what down to a Python report. Okay. in, in two slides. So the island will see billions of dollars and the stakeholders want to recover soonest. That is the what they're going to get. They've got a lot of damage all over these islands. People are out of their houses, don't have jobs. There is no church. <laughs> and they're exasperated they're frustrated that's the what the island will then inventory its damaged property infrastructure economy that's the how many and where okay we're going to go out and let's let's put quantify the damage then you come back with the estimates of time of completion and that gives you the win all right so now got totally demolished islands We've inventoried the damage and we've determined by project when they should be completed, funded and completed. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a Python report that's used uh, to measure and manage this environment. Next slide, please. Now this is a uh, example uh, and you, and you see here on the left side where it has uh, uh, buildings, uh, emergency support services, debris removal, Parks and recreation. This is all the different areas that have been damaged. Uh, roads and bridges, utilities, et cetera, goes on and on. So now we've gone out, we've done a uh, inventory of all the damage out there. And then you look across these steps, the dark blue, the gold, the red, the light blue. These are now the process and procedures and the steps that these projects have to go to be funded and for the hammers to start swinging. Now, uh, we broke, broke these down uh, uh, step by step under the count where we have 41 in step one, 12 in step two, all the way over. And you have, I think my quick math says that's about 93 um, projects that have to be pushed through this process, pig through a Python, pushed through this process for this phase to be complete. So the pig is mostly right now denoted by the large blue bar and the count that says 41 is mostly up front. But over time, we're going to see that to mostly go to gold. So gold will swell up. Then you want gold to go over red. So red will swell up. And then you want red to go and all of it, in fact, to go to the light blue and all 93 to be in the light blue. It's called a pipe. How do you use this? First of all, just putting it together serves a very useful purpose of understanding your as is. What is the one? It, it's an organizing construct. And then it also tells you, obviously, what the 2B is. What do you want the 2B? You want all 93 to be light blue, basically. Can be used in communications. We used a Python report. It's called the Governor's Report uh, in Katrina. And we were getting data calls every day. Uh, from the White House, foreign leaders, the Clintons, uh, all, all sorts of people. And finally, we said, you know, let's just start to dis distribute the governor's report, which is a Python report, had 13 steps in it, and had the cases broken down by the different steps. And we said, we're just going to give this out to everybody every day, and they'll know exactly where we are. We did some good communication around that, and everyone seemed to be very happy with that. You'll use it to review and manage the progress of the program. If it was me on a daily basis, what I would do is have people meet focused on this report on a daily basis uh, early in the morning and they work all day long to see that pig move through the Python. Um, and then it can obviously be used for problem solving. If it's not moving, what's the problem? You dig deeper. And you work the five whys. That's a whole other methodology. You can look that up, but it's called the five whys. And uh, you can dig deeper on the problem solving using that methodology. So it, it can be used to coordinate the project every single day. Okay. So that's basically um, 
what I'd like to sort of get across today. I'm going to leave you now with, next slide. I'm, I'm going to leave you now with uh, some other critical success factors and maybe reemphasize a few things. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go to Q&A. So um, actively track and mitigate misinformation. Hard stop right there. Now, what I mean by that is a lot of stakeholders don't always have uh, the outcome uh, in mind that you do. And sometimes uh, there's misinformation out there, many of the times. Track the misinformation, work to correct the misinformation. You cannot let misinformation go wild about your program. You can't, you, you have to have some effort and keeping people on track with what the true story is. I think you can look to this country right now and about masks and other issues and say, wow, uh, we really need to correct the misinformation. Uh, but you need, to, you need to mitigate all risks, right? You need to have an active risk mitigation process together with any large project such as this. Be proactive with stakeholders and make that communication a part of your everyday work. Devote resources to this. If you don't do it, you get further into the project, things, the wheels start coming off, you're going to say to yourself, wow, this stakeholder is causing a lot of problems. I wish I had gotten uh, closer to them sooner. Uh, don't have that thought. Devote resources to this. Uh, do it early. Don't, don't get to the end and find out that you should have done it. Be clear about outcomes and link actions accordingly. Um, make sure that you and the stakeholders know what success looks like and agree on that. Get it in writing. Take notes. In this environment, there's not a meeting I don't take notes in. Always take notes. People's, people's memory fades. They get amnesia. Take notes. Be clear about, uh, I'm sorry, develop and use data as a strategy. Um, Take this seriously. Don't get too far down the road with a program and find out you don't have process measures and results measures. You, you're not managing. You're really not managing if you can't do that. You need to have your P and R measures. Establish that up front. If you can't define the uh, program in those terms, uh, you might have a more fundamental problem, right? Uh, you need to be able to quantify your work, measure it, and manage it. To, uh, uh, as different outcomes are required. Look, look, look at COVID in this country right now. Uh, we, we have uh, a changing fluid situation. A different outcome from our program, in fact, be required. We need to be flexible. I have not been in a single disaster crisis where this didn't happen. It will happen. So you need to agile, and I would also recommend the easy button uh, from a PMO perspective. And then let me just go back and emphasize one more thing. Be servant-minded, problem-solve, problem-solve, problem-solve. If you do that, you'll have a respected leadership, and you'll get through it. You'll be successful. All right. Slide. I think that concludes uh, what I wanted to make. So uh, thank you uh, to the audience. And obviously, um, in this situation, keep safe. Um, and now we'll turn it back over to uh, George, I believe, for the Q&A. George? Hi, Andrew. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. So um, got a few a few quick Q and A questions that have come through directly, and uh, to me and, and to Joanna as well. So Joanna, please do uh, to give us a shout with the questions that that's come to you. The first question that I have, uh, and I and I've got uh, a couple over here, is how do these strategies change as the crisis increases or decreases? So I'll just read that again. How how do these strategies change as the crisis increases or decreases? Uh, uh, um, that is sort of why, if you go back in the slides to the one that has the blown out PMO, 
um, uh, that I referenced as a bonus slide. That's why I included that slide. Because as, now I first showed you a very simple like four person PMO to get started with a, with a um, um, project around. So that's a pretty real world example. But um, this, this slide reflects a much larger PMO. Uh, so as the crisis morphs, changes, grows, you're going to want to be able to stack up and deliver new tools and methodologies. Maybe they're listed here in the crisis PMO architecture. Maybe there are other ones that need to be delivered. Uh, but you're, you're going to want to uh, maintain an agile approach to even your organization and your structure and how you're currently doing things. I would say all that's on the table as the crisis grows. Um, great, great, great question. Now, as it gets smaller, you have to look at it and think about restructuring and down, uh, uh, down sourcing the structure and the people, et cetera, um, and make sure that the uh, architecture and the staff and the process uh, of the program is not too burdensome for the amount of work. So you're almost, uh, I would tell you, I would tell you an organizational structure in this environment uh, almost changes in some manner on a, certainly a quarterly basis, certainly a quarterly basis. Things are changing all the time. Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. So another question was, how do these ch um, change according to um, sectors? I'm going, to, I'm going to interpret the sector, and correct me if I'm not in, interpreting correctly. I'm going to interpret the sector uh, to mean, um, in this case, mostly what I'm talking about is crisis and disaster management. But it could be, there could be oil and gas, there could be insurance. Is, is that, do we think that's what the, uh, uh, the thing, do we think it's crisis management in those different no, yes. sectors? I just want to get some specific. No, I think crisis management in the difference. Okay, okay. So, um, I'd say it, it it would change depending on the sector's maturity for handling disasters and crisis. Do they have any of this set up already? And some do, some don't. Um, now, COVID is challenging people. There are some corporate entities out there that have a pretty robust corporate PM dealing with, as an example, cybersecurity. Okay, so that that's that's good news. They have a PMO. They're used to dealing with, uh, you know, certain crises uh, per se. Um, but certain sectors are not going to have uh, the concept of a PMO uh, established corporately, and you're going to have to be. I would say walk before you run with the ones that don't have any understanding or adoption of program management constructs uh, and go real simple, go real light to get started. Don't try to, to go to this slide day one. That's, that would be a mistake. Now, if you're a large corporate environment and you have, uh, you have employees that by necessity of their work, closely together, uh, you have a bigger problem. And your PMO architecture and the buy-in from the corporate decision makers needs to understand that risk and reflect that risk. And that, that would require a bigger investment in, in remediating that 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 uh, that risk in that, in that certain situation. Yeah, and Joanna, I'm going to add to that. Um, if you take, for example, something like the uh, Fukushima nuclear disaster, where the tsunami uh, basically um, caused a uh, nuclear fault at, at the plant there, uh, the government had to think about how to respond at multiple levels. So they had to deal with the immediate situation of how to contain the issue at the nuclear plant. 
they had to deal with the issue of how to deal with the uh, contamination, uh, particularly since it was uh, uh, based right at the edge of the sea. Uh, so they had to think about how they were going to deal with containment. They had to think about how they were going to deal with healthcare. So again, if you take that construct of uh, having a central uh, coordinated uh, response, so that leadership role that's making the real-time decisions that's connected to the politicians and the government, but you also have this connected response network. So you have a project team that might be working directly with the uh, nuclear plant staff to try to deal with the containment issues and they're coordinating with uh, the uh, Navy, for example, to try to figure out how to keep shipping out of the area and how to deal again with trying to limit the containment. You're using that hub and spoke model and you're evolving it as the situation unfolds. So in addition to the to the PMO architecture and structure, the PMO is not operating in isolation. It's actually connected to these spokes and these activities that are going on within the community. So I think that's an important piece to think about as well, that in, in the case of a major disaster, there may be multiple uh, entities that are involved. So you have to think about business interests. You have to think about uh, sector-related uh, interests that may uh, be impacted by that particular area. You may have to think about how your healthcare system is going to respond and how food distribution and things like that are taken care of. So that hub and spoke model, I think, is uh, is is really critical to think about. And as Andrew mentioned, with this PMO uh, crisis PMO architecture, it's where is the most immediate situation that is the greatest threat that you need to address. And you build the capabilities that you need over time. You don't necessarily jump in and focus on the structure. You're focusing on the response and building the structure that enables you to respond most effectively. Thanks, Stephen. I, I, if I, Go on, Andrew. Uh, say one thing. Yeah, the uh, Fukushima is a good example. Uh, actually, it's it. You know, you would think, well, it doesn't sound like a COVID, but it is in a way because it was what we call a black swan event. Meaning, it wasn't just a single event that happened and then it was over. It was something that evolved and had long term repercussions and that they had to deal with. COVID is much the same way. So any study of Fukushima and how they responded and how they networked their stakeholders in particular. Uh, that's, that is a very similar, uh, crisis. Okay. Um, ne next question I have is, if I can just read it out. Um, so many of us do not have a PMO set up. However, our organizations, uh, still run projects. Um, how would we set up a, a PMO and what is, what is the value? I, I love that question. Uh, here's here's some my thinking around that. Um, I would I would advocate and start small. I would get behind some of the leadership's initiatives. Focus on those. Uh, you know, have the conversation with them. You know, to tell us what are one to two to three things that you like us to focus on that are very important to you. That if we do that well, and the outcome is successful that you would have your support for further work in that area. Um, and, and, and most importantly, I'm going to the point, uh, most importantly, begin from, from uh, uh, the very first one to start using data. You know, leaders love to, for you to come back and have empirical evidence of something working or not working. To the extent you can show a mass using data and taking data and building knowledge so that you can make decisions, I would wager your senior leadership will be very impressed with that. Yeah, and George, just to follow up on that, uh, PMI actually has a white paper series on developing your organizational project management capabilities. And a piece of that uh, also deals with, uh, one, using a program structure 
uh, to help enable uh, the change. So uh, don't just jump in and, and think that you can very easily set up a PMO. Create a, a program structure to help you think about and work with your executives to build, to align the building of the PMO to critical organization business objectives. Then secondly, develop it uh, in an iterative fashion so that you can make adjustments and changes and continue to improve and evolve uh, the PMO over time. So one of the things that we can provide as follow-up uh, to this uh, webinar, in addition to the link to the recording, uh, is a link also to those white papers. So I will make sure that we, uh, we have that for you. That's great. Uh, thank, thanks a lot uh, to both of you. And uh, that the final question, unless Joanna has others, but the final question from my side is, besides Python, which other data analysis tools would you recommend for decision support? Let me let me let me answer that by saying that uh, there's multiple products out there. There's there it depends on your sector that you're in. Uh, P3, everyone in construction knows what that what that means and uh, what the Oracle tools uh, look like. Um, and if scheduling is a big part of the task, then obviously that's a uh, uh, that's something to look like look at. Uh, there are other tools out there that I've used successfully. One was uh, Siloxis. But more than talking about tools, I would I would encourage people to look at the uh, low code program environment and what's going on there. There's a whole genre of tools that are coming out that uh, are cloud based that take very little programming to leverage and you can stand up a data warehouse uh, in the cloud and and start producing reports within I, I mean I've seen it uh, happen in hours and there's some expertise out there I have I have a company in particular that I work with uh, IFA that that uh, uh, makes it very easy to stand up a data warehouse for a, a program and begin producing reports. Uh, almost uh, of any design, I would say, you can come up with Python reports, you can come up with other reports that might reflect latencies uh, and uh, 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 pull in some scheduling information, et cetera. And um, uh, all of that is, is um, uh, very useful in uh, especially a, a a new PMO that uh, that you're trying to build credibility and buy support. I'm going to go back to that point and hit it one more time. To the extent that we can, you can uh, build uh, that into the initial implementation of a new PMO. Um, I I feel like the senior people have a very hard time cutting off support for someone that's really turning data into information for decision making. It's very difficult to make that decision. Okay, um, I think I think that's it with questions. Um, I'm not sure if Joanna has any, but on my side, that is all we have. Thanks, George. Yeah, no more questions from my side. Thank you. Great. So I think. Where we can round up if there if there are no more questions, uh, maybe give it a, a minute or two to get uh, any any final questions coming through. So just to uh, just to close out, um, thank you everybody. Thanks thanks a lot for for, for your time on on, on this chat. Um, in terms of uh, action points from us, we will send over the recording, um, send over the, the PMO white paper, and also uh, include the slides as we, uh, in, in, as we send out this, uh, this email. But what I think would be great is if we could get feedback from yourselves as well, um, you know, specifically about um, continuing this, the series uh, and also any specific questions that you have around today's, uh, today's webinar, uh, and then going forward also, the uh, any 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 topics that you might have in mind. 
So, you know, feel free to, to, to respond to my emails. It's George Asamani. Um, for those organizations that are looking to uh, develop their PMOs or even the, you know, just their project managers, do feel free to get in touch. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, you know, we work with organizations to, to improve their execution. So again, just, just get in touch directly with, uh, with myself and you know, connect you with, with the rest of the organization. Uh, I see a question in here. Uh, can we get the contact details of the panelists? Uh, yes, we'll share, we'll share that as well. So uh, you, you'll receive that shortly. So if there are no more comments from, uh, from any of the panelists, um, again, once again, thank you. And uh, I'd like to close out the session. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Andrew. Sorry, go on. Just said thank you, everyone. Indeed.